Students, here we are on our study of diabetes and complications. Now we're going to talk about neuropathy. Neuropathy. What is a neuropathy? Well, pathological changes to nerve tissue. Pathological changes to nerve tissue. Okay, what might cause this? Well, diabetic neuropathy can be related to how long you've been a diabetic, duration of illness, and having consistently high glucose levels. High glucose levels above normal. One key thing I want you to keep in mind. Duration of diabetes is probably the key indicator for neuropathy. Okay, now let's get some facts and let's get some figures. Let's get some facts and let's get some figures. Here we are up here. Prevalence. 30% of diabetics over the age of 40 will have some sort of impaired feeling in one area of their foot. 30%. 13% of all di diabetics experience neuropathy. Now, also, 50% of diabe diabetics with diabetes for more than 25 years, more than 25 years, experience neuropathy. So 50% of the people that have had diabetes for more than 25 years will experience neuropathies. Now, we classify neuropathies in three categories, at least for our discussion according to our textbook. So what are these three categories? Mono, mononeuropathy, mononeuropathy, polyneuropathy, and autonomic neuropathy. Mono, poly, autonomic. Let's take a look at mono. Let's take a look at mono. I call this the ouch, ouch. In the mono, it affects one nerve or a group of nerves caused by inadequate blood supply to a muscle and characterized by sharp stabbing pain. Ouch, sharp stabbing pain, sometimes relieved with walking. Okay, that's mononeuropathy. Now, let's go to poly. We know poly means many. Now, here, worse at night. Polyneuropathy is worse at night. Now, some good news here. Can resolve spontaneously. Can resolve spontaneously. Let me show you this little illustration we have here. These here are two legs. And um, what happens in poly? Neuropathy is bilateral, bilateral, symmetrical involvement. What do we mean? This is what we mean. Both legs are affected. Okay? Both legs are affected. See? Both legs and the green represents what's affected. What is it like when you experience polyneuropathy? What does the patient experience? Tingling, numbness, burning. Tingless, numbing, burning. Or... Just the opposite. Absolutely no feeling. No feeling at all. Either no feeling or tingling, numbness, or burning. That's with polyneuropathy. Now we get to one that's a little bit more involved. It affects some very serious parts of the body. And that is autonomic neuropathy. And why do they call it autonomic? Because this affects the autonomic nervous system. This affects the autonomic nervous system. All right, we remember our autonomic nervous system is sympathetic, which speeds up the body, the fight-flight. And then we have the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps us with urinating, helps us with digestion, eating, that sort of thing. Okay, so if we have autonomic neuropathy, let's look at some of the areas that are going to be affected. I put down atonic bladder. Basically, what that means is you may have urinary retention. You have urine staying in your bladder that you don't want to stay in. Okay? So it can affect, affect the urinary system with urinary retention in the bladder. Sex. For the male, the male may have erectile dysfunction. And also may I add, which I didn't write here, is that the male may have what they call retrograde ejaculation. During ejaculation, for the man, the sympathetic nervous system kicks in and closes off the bladder so the semen doesn't go into the bladder. But remember, when the autonomic nervous system is damaged, it won't perform well, 
And so the sphincter won't close and some of the semen or a amount of the semen will end up in the bladder. Okay? Retrograde ejaculation. So that's for the men. Erectile dysfunction or retrograde ejaculation. For the female, painful intercourse uh, may be due to uh, a lack of lubrication. Let's go to the GI system. Here we have our stomach. Now, the stomach can distend when you have autonomic neuropathy. You may have what they call gastroparesis, which basically means the stomach's really not moving. Not like it should, anyways. And then we get a condition called delayed gastric emptying. Delayed gastric emptying. Okay? And remember, like, for the, those patients that have a G-tube or an NG tube for feeding, sometimes we check the residual, and for a diabetic, long-standing diabetic, the residual may be increased, and it might be due to the fact that they have um, GI symptoms as a result of autonomic neuropathy. Also, they may have bloating. bloating excuse me. Another component of the GI factor is constipation. 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 Rarely, sometimes, it manifests itself in diarrhea. Okay, that's a GI component of autonomic neuropathy. Let's get to the heart. A little more serious here. Let's get to the heart. Now, um, the patient will present with resting tachycardia. We don't expect the heart to have to speed up while you're resting. Okay? But this is what may occur when you have autonomic neuropathy when it affects the heart. Also, postural hypotension. What does this mean? Well, uh, when you suddenly get up and all of a sudden you start to feel dizzy. You start to feel dizzy. Okay, a couple other things here. What about exercise? What about exercise? Well, this neuropathy affects the exercise. You'll have exercise intolerance for one. And number two, usually when you start running, what happens is the sympathetic nervous system helps you, speeds up the heart and gets things going. But guess what? In a neuropathy, it may not do this job. Okay, so you have some trouble with exercise. Next we have amyotrophy, which really basically means weakening of the muscles. And this usually affects the thighs and the buttocks. Here we see a normal muscle in size. Here we see a muscle that's atrophied. And this is what happens in amyotrophy. Not only that, after it atrophies, the muscles will tend to have these un involuntary twitches called fasciculations. Fasciculations. It's been reported that you can even see them occurring in the thighs when they happen. Another interesting uh, component of autonomic neuropathy is the issue of sweating. As an example, you may have gustatory sweating. You eat certain foods and all of a sudden you start sweating. That's called gustatory sweating. Or in your body, you might have areas where you have a lot of sweating. That's called hyperhidrosis. Guess what? At the same time, you may have areas where there's no sweating. That's called anhydrosis. All right. Now, one of the other important factors that, are, that may occur with autonomic neuropathy is hypoglycemic unawareness hypoglycemic unawareness. And we know that hypoglycemia is a life-threatening situation. So our body has a warning system much like uh, a smoke detector in a home. It would be in pretty bad shape if you had a fire and the smoke detector didn't go off. Well, with hypoglycemic unawareness, the alarm is off. How does, what does that mean? Well, what is the first manifestation of hypoglycemia? Well, your body responds by the sympathetic component of the autonomic nervous system kicking in. Guess what? The alarm system is on. So these are the signs and symptoms that you won't see. Tachycardia, palpitations, tremors, sweating, nervousness. All those first signs of a hypoglycemic episode will be absent. Will be absent. Okay, now... An exhortation here. Oh, these are pretty serious complications. Neuropathy can have some very, very serious complications. So, the best thing is avoidance. What are we going to try and do? Try and manage our blood glucose levels to keep them as normal as possible. 
Okay, there you have it for our complication on neuropathy. And thank you for listening.